talked a lot in the past about how the three types of fabrication, bodily, verbal, mental, play a role in shaping our experience. Recently, I, though, I read a piece that, where someone was saying, well, these three kinds of fabrication apply only to meditation, as if they didn't apply to the rest of your life. But of course, the mind that's meditating is the same mind that goes out and deals with the world. And it's precisely because these same processes shape our experience in the ordinary, everyday world, as they do in meditation, that the meditation is really a good tool for getting to understand how your mind creates suffering, because that's what the Four Noble Truths are all about. It's not that life is suffering, it's that we create suffering by clinging. The source of the suffering is not outside, it's what we do as we approach experience, as we create our experience, out of the raw materials that come from our past karma. So as you're getting to know the mind in meditation, you're also getting to know the mind in everyday life. As you put concentration together. Start with the breath. Try to breathe in a way that feels good, that feels nourishing. Restful if you're feeling tense. Energizing if you're feeling tired. And then talk to yourself. That's what verbal fabrication is. Talk to yourself about how the breath is doing and what you might do to make it better, and when it's good, what you might do to let that sensation of good breathing spread around. And you hold certain perceptions in mind. The perceptions and feelings, of course, are mental fabrication. The perceptions and the labels you apply to things, or the images you hold in mind. What kind of image of the breath is good? Think of the breath as energy flowing through the body, and it can flow through the nerves. You might have an image of the nerves. You might have an image of your blood vessels and the whole circulatory system extending out to the little pores of the skin, and breath suffusing that whole mass, that whole intricate system. And then there's feelings. You've got a feeling of ease. Well, what do you do with it? Do something that makes it nice to stay here. As the sense of breath flows through the body, think of the sense of ease flowing together with the breath, and your awareness extending out for the whole body this, to cover this whole range. This is how you put concentration together. And then whatever comes up, you can talk to yourself about how to deal with different distractions. Some distractions, all I have to do is note them, and you go right back to the breath. No big deal. Those are the distractions without much of a hook. They just seem to be churned up randomly. But the others have hooks and can be pretty tenacious. There are some other cases where you have to look at the drawbacks. The Buddha gives you here another metal fabrication image to hold in mind, that you've got the carcass of a dead snake or a dead dog around your neck, and you want to get rid of it. So learn to look at your distracting thoughts like dead dogs, dead snakes hanging around your neck. In other words, don't let yourself see them as interesting or enticing or worth thinking about. And of course, if the contemplation of their drawbacks is going to work, you have to also see, well, what's, what's the allure? Why did you like to go from them to begin with? And sometimes you don't see that until you tell yourself, no, I'm just not going to think that thought. The mind will come up with a reason for wanting to think of it. And sometimes it'll be a verbal fabrication, and sometimes it'll be a mental fabrication. But this is how the mind creates distractions to begin with. This is how it operates as it goes through the world. And you're getting to see that. And the Buddha is giving you new tools to use against that. This is why there's so many analogies in the canon, new ways of perceiving.
or different ways of perceiving from what you ordinarily do. Most of us don't think of thoughts of lust as a dead snake or a dead dog, but that's a good image to hold in mind. Thoughts of anger, thoughts of anxiety. Learn to perceive them as something you really do want to get rid of. And once you can get your mind on the side of the Dharma in this way, that's half the battle right there. This is a good part of the mind that says, I don't want to give up my lust or my anger or whatever. These have been my defenses. These have been my ways of finding entertainment in the past. Again, more verbal fabrication. So you need verbal fabrication to fight it. Our thoughts just seem to be running random and unstoppable. You can tell yourself, okay, I'll just let them be there, but I'm not get, going to get involved. Here are the images of a person closing his eyes. They're there, but you don't have to look at them. You look away. You've got the breath. Thoughts don't destroy the breath. And they're not why you're here to begin with. So focus in on the breath and let them have whatever corner of the mind they're going to have. So what you're learning to do is use these processes of bodily, mental, and verbal fabrication to fight your old ways of using bodily, verbal, and mental fabrication. You may notice that when you're thinking about something, there's going to be tension in part of the body. Well, breathe through that. You can use your bodily fabrication there. There are lots of ways that you can think to yourself, talk to yourself, or the images you can bring to mind to counteract the ones you've been hanging around with all along. Because these forms of fabrication, they are karma. That was the other thing that was weird about that passage. It's talking about how fabrication in the five aggregates, which is said was something different from the three types of fabrication, is not really karmic. Oh, it's not karmic. What are you doing? The way you look at things, the way you think about things, that's going to incline your mind in that direction. If you have old ways of looking and you don't change them, the mind gets in a big rut. And of course it's going to have karmic consequences. So you've got this power here, the power of action. And as we're meditating, we're learning how to use it well, learning how to divide things up so we can get a handle on what the mind is doing. When you get the mind in a state of concentration like this, you can fight off the distractions. You begin to see that you, you're engaging in these kinds of fabrication all the time. Emotions are a big example of that. Different emotions will have different ways of breathing going on with them, different ways of talking to yourself. You can talk to yourself in a way that excites anger, and you can talk to yourself in a way that gets rid of anger. And the same with your perceptions. And all too often we're not waiting for something outside to happen before we th suddenly think thoughts of anger. So we're often out there looking for something to get angry about. And we feel that anger is our protection. So we kind of ward off things by finding fault with things before, before they can do us harm. There are lots of ways we talk ourselves into wanting to be angry or wanting to be lustful. We've got to learn how to look at them in a different way. Use different images in the mind, use different ways of talking to yourself. So as you're getting the mind into concentration, it's not just resting. You're getting hands-on experience with how you shape a state of mind. And then you can use that same knowledge to look at the other states of mind, the emotions, whatever. And particularly look at the way the mind talks to itself. There's one kind of clinging, the Buddha calls clinging to habits and practices. Many people see that just simply as you're holding on to rules that 
petty rules or petty rituals. It's not that. It's your idea that I've got to think in this way or I've got to act in this way. And if I, do in so if I don't do that, something really bad is going to happen, even though those ideas about how you have to think and how you have to act are actually causing you trouble. There's a sense of ought in some of our clinging. It's not just pure lust or pure desire. Sometimes we tell ourselves, this is the way it's got to be. And then we get ourselves into trouble and wonder why we're suffering. That's this verbal fabrication. So learn how to question these things. And you do that first by getting another skill. This is how you use fabrications as you meditate in a skillful way. And once you know how to do it in a skillful way, why go back to your old ways? What keeps pulling you back? The fact that you've got this alternative gives you a perspective you wouldn't have had otherwise. It also gives you a good place to stand as you're taking apart your old habits. So see the importance of fabricating a state of concentration and maintaining it. Again, this issue of talking to yourself is going to be important. Sometimes you tell yourself, I'm sitting here with my mind in concentration and nothing is happening. One important part of concentration is just that. Learn to be patient. It's not the case you get the mind into concentration and immediately move on to the next stage. Sometimes you have to stay right here, because things in the mind are not going to necessarily show themselves right away. So you have to learn how to content yourself. See the concentration as a skill that you want to develop and take some pride in your workmanship. It's like sharpening a knife. When I was over in Thailand, we didn't have knife sharpeners where you can just zip, zip, and the knife is sharp. They had a big stone and some water, and that was it. And you had to rub the, the knife, usually a machete, against the stone and wet the stone every now and then to make sure that it didn't dry out. And you had to talk to yourself while you were doing this so you didn't get bored, and that you maintained your alertness. Because after all, you don't want to sharpen some points too much, and you're going to spoil the blade. There has to be an evenness to your effort and a consistency. And you have to learn how to give yourself pep talks all along the way. Because your mind wanders off someplace else, all of a sudden you find you've ruined the blade. So you stay on top of things and then talk to yourself just enough to keep yourself content staying on top of things right there. It'll take a while, but then you've got a good sharp blade. And the same with concentration. Sometimes you sit here and say, well, where's the entertainment? Where are the lights? Where's the cameras? Where are the action? You say, nope, this is it. After all, where was the Buddha on the night of his awakening? He was Mind was in the fourth jhana. The mind right there at the breath, very quiet. Yet he was able to see what was going on in his mind, going on in his breath in a way that led to awakening. So you're at the right spot once the mind settles down. The question is simply learn how to see this spot with more care from the right angle. And the beginning stage is learning how to be content to be here. So again, this more verbal fabrication, mental fabrication, bodily fabrication, that not only gets you into concentration, but keeps you here. You know, learn how to keep yourself happy to be here. To fight off thoughts that say this is boring. Again, what is that thought? It's a verbal fabrication. Well, you've got other verbal fabrications. Say, who cares? I'm here doing something I haven't done before, making the mind really consistent in its concentration. And I haven't yet seen the full potential of this state, so I'm going to stick with it. So 
So as long as you're going to fabricate your experiments, you might as well do it well. When you really learn how to do it well, that's how you learn how not to fabricate anything at all. That's the stage that comes with practice. So, but it, where is the practice going to happen? It's going to happen right here as you're fabricating your state of concentration, as you're breathing, as you're talking to yourself, as you're using different perceptions, making use of your feelings of pleasure here. And it's in doing these things that you gain your insight. Dogen has a nice passage where he says that the duty with regard to the Third Noble Truth is to realize it, and the duty with regard to the Fourth Noble Truth is to develop it. And those two things go together. They're basically the same thing. As you're developing it, the path, the goal appears. He's not saying the path is the goal. He's saying that the process of paying full attention to developing the path is where you're going to realize the cessation of suffering. That's all right here. It's just a question of learning how to be content to stay right here and stable enough here so you can really see what's happening right here. So you're at the right spot, just learn how to fabricate it well. <laughs>